hoping my internet behaves. I've, you know what it is? After running my special new cable all the way from the bottom of the house to the top of the house, and I've had the most amazing internet ever, but of course I'm now going into an, an ethernet port on my computer that I've never used before. Literally never. I mean, this computer's coming on for probably 10 years old or something. It's it, it ancient. Yeah, it's, it's probably 10, 10 base T. Yeah, you know, yeah. Rocking these awesome power of... Uh... <laughs> 10 megabit per second. Which is still better than I had before, but True. I've had some weird problems, um, and I've checked it. Yeah, I saw you put a note out on uh, on Twitter about... Uh, you know what it is? It looks like it's a blooming Windows 10 bug with this particular network card. Yeah, we are collectively shocked that that could be a problem, Andy. I know, I think, it's, uh, I'm going to check, but I think this is the first ever bug found in Windows. Really? Incredible. You should claim for the bug bounty on that, shouldn't you? I should, because up until this point, Windows was entirely stable and, and faultless. But, uh, yeah. Well, ever since uh, ever since the Windows software engineers moved to work on the YouTube Studio beta, it's been absolutely fantastic, you know. That's, Is that a thing? No, no, just I'm making that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway, I've had this weird problem where um, upload disappears like i have Jeez. zero upload speed like i'll go on all the um and the thing is you can still surf the web but even when you're surfing the web you need a certain amount of upload because obviously every time you click on something it's sending yeah, yeah. It, yeah um so you can surf the web but you can't the the upload speed is like 0. 0.00 megabits per second you know it's like tiny it's enough to surf the web but it's not enough to do anything else and um, I was digging into it loads, and it looks like it's some sort of weird Windows 10 bug with this particular network card. Mm -hmm. And because it's so old, it'll never, ever get fixed. So I went out and bought one of these little dongle network cards, like a USB one. Oh, right. So um, you're gonna... And this is even worse. This, like, it'll connect, and then it'll suddenly just disconnect. So I'm sending that back. <laughs> so I'm going to have to um, buy a new physical network card for my computer. Honestly, I'm never going to escape the world of IT. I've, I've come to the conclusion. No, obviously. Uh, if, you know, if you, you can check out, we can never leave, right? I, I think that's the thing. I, th I think it's IT just haunting me for the rest of my life. Welcome back to the Measuring Up podcast, the UK's first and possibly favourite commercial joinery podcast. I'm Andy McClellan and I run a cabinet making business up in sunny Newcastle upon Tyne. And I'm Peter Millard, as well as running a virtual 10 minute workshop for YouTube. I also run a small and far too full carpentry and cabinet making workshop in the garden spot of West London. Every couple of weeks, we get together in our internet cafe to talk about the topics of the day, whatever takes our fancy or whatever's been suggested by you, our fantastic listeners. But before we get into any of that, Andy Mac, welcome back. How have you been? I've, I've been very well, thank you. And and what about yourself? Are, are you doing okay? Yeah, doing all right, thank you. Uh, re refreshed and relaxed and rested after a week away in uh, in in Venice, which was rather beautiful. Yes, how was Venice? That was lovely. Um, we're the, we, we go every year around this sort of time, and last year we arrived to snow, which was a first, and this year we arrived to glorious sunshine it was absolutely beautiful oh, fantastic uh for the first few days and then it uh it started raining from sort of wednesday night and didn't really stop uh, it wasn't heavy on thursday it was just a bit showery but uh yeah it's uh, you know it, it it clears the streets pretty effectively that's for sure uh so yeah well, the the crowds thin out yeah. I, I saw some pictures where the streets were literally underwater they are it was it was one of those things i put a little thing on uh on instagram um it was We've been going to Venice, my wife, for, I think we said that this was our 21st visit we worked out. And uh, we've never seen, we've never experienced the, the aqua alta, the high water. They have a very high tide around this time of year. And the highest usually happens overnight or in the wee small hours. Uh, and this time, uh, just for the time that we were there, uh, th it was the, the highest of the high tide was about 11.30. So we went out in the, in the wet rain at uh, about half past 10 at night. Uh, just to have a look, and um, purely by by luck rather than judgment, uh, we were staying in the Dozaduro, which is one of the higher parts of um, of Venice, as it happens. So it doesn't doesn't get affected too badly. But even then, the canals were right up over the over the pavements uh, to a you know ankle ankle deep. So yeah, it was uh, it was 
It was uh, fascinating. You know, we've, we've never seen it before. We've seen in some of the lower lying parts, uh, St. Mark's Square is particularly low lying. And at times you, you just get water sort of fountaining up through drains, basically, as, as the, the pressure of the water comes through. That's the lowest point. So it just sort of squirts up through the, through the pavement, which is pretty interesting to see. Obviously, it's a, a place designed to handle water, but is it designed to handle that amount of water is it does it flow into shops and yeah they seem to yeah they they have they have sort of duck boards you know raised platforms that they put out in the lower lying areas uh, and they were out in readiness uh I, I don't know if they were used particularly because obviously it happened overnight was the was the worst but certainly the the the, the little street where in the the apartment that we stay generally is at the end of that street, it's got the canal, and at the other end of that, it's right opposite the, the Peggy Guggenheim collection, the art museum, so it's quite, you know, very, very convenient. And there's a couple of restaurants at either end, there were people coming out at, you know, half past ten at night, and suddenly realising that they have to paddle <laughs> ankle deep uh, through all this water to get home. And they were sort of on the bridge, not knowing quite what to, get, what to do before they suddenly realised that, yeah, it's raining, yeah, it's not going to yeah. go away for a few more hours. You know, you've got no choice but to get your shoes and socks off and walk. Uh, and walk crazy. Yeah. It looked amazing, though. Some of the architecture looked stunning. I mean, some of the buildings you were in. And- it is. It's, it's a... It's a, an extraordinary place, um, obviously very old, a real tourist trap. You know, uh, a large part of its income is derived from tourism. So you, where there are large masses of tourists, you're going to get, you know, uh, large masses of, of tourist tat to cater to them. And yet, even though it's a fairly small city, uh, you can you can get away from people very quickly, very easily, turn a couple of corners and... It's like there's nobody else there. It's, it's amazing. Um, I, we we love it. We we love it. We'll, I think we're going to go back later in the year as well, uh, just for another visit, a little bit longer. I'd, I'd love to go at some point. Yeah. yeah, it's well worth a visit. You know, uh, 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 and and the you know, I, I do this, and I don't know if you do this as well, but you go to places and you start looking at the infrastructure, the the structure of how it's made and how it's built, and how the the pavement are and all that sort of stuff. All all the the curb stones, if you like, the the edges of the pavements to the canal are all white. They're a, they're a contrasting colour to the actual pavements. And of course, as the canal floods and the pavements get underwater, you can still see where where the edge of the pavement is. So if you were paddling home, you're not going to take a misstep and go into the canal by accident. Ah, uh, right, so, right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, obviously they've, they've thought of this. I don't know how many people actually did that before, <laughs> before they actually put those pavements in. Yeah, can, um, there'll have been a committee saying, we've got to change the colour of the edges of these, right, yeah. these uh, canals. Uh, or, or maybe that <laughs> happened in the 1600s, I, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. Again, just said little things. If we have floods, then, you know, the pave. Uh, the paving stones will start to lift or there's all kinds of raw sewage that comes up or all kinds of nasty muck and rubbish. This is just seawater and, and somehow the the sewage and all the rest of it is kept away. So even though two-thirds of Venice was underwater that night, the next morning, you know, we, we were up and out quite early to, to get a water bus back to the airport, but people had been out and, and swept up already uh, people were sweeping up outside their streets, and none of the paving stones had lifted. In fact, we'd we'd been to uh, we we try and avoid the the real sort of tourist hotspots, but we we particularly wanted to go through St Mark's Square to see somewhere. St Mark's Square is one of the one of the big sort of main tourist attractions. You can go to the top of the Campanile and see some great views of Venice. Uh, St Mark's Square itself is a is an extraordinary piece of sort of wedding cake architecture. Uh, you can have an overpriced cup of coffee at the Florian Cafe, or uh, there's a couple of other little little places as well. And we've been meaning to go to one of them for a long time. Uh, we went there this time. There's a, an Olivetti showroom, which desi- uh, was designed in 1958 uh, by Italian architect uh, Scarpa, is his, his surname. And it's been preserved, uh, and it's just extraordinary. And we knew it was there. It's tucked away in a corner, and it's like nothing else oh, wow. in Venice at all. You think all 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 these stuff that you all the stuff that we're seeing now in architecture, polished concrete, uh, hardwood inserted into into concrete slabs. 
that's all in this building from 1958. It's, it's just extraordinary. Beautifully designed, lovely, lovely preservation job, a restoration job on it. Uh, and you can go in and walk around and take pictures for the princely summer 12 euros. Um, yeah, really, really, really nice. Really interesting. Well, well worth a look. We're going back later in the year, and I'm really toying with the idea of doing a, a not a travel log sort of Venetian tour, but alternative Venice. These little sort of designy uh, uh, and structural little bits and pieces. Yeah. I've, I've gone off uh, gone off on a tangent. We were talking about yeah. You know, when you go away, you start looking at the structure structure of places and how things are made and like the the paving stones they happen to be lifting a couple of paving stones paving slabs in St Mark's Square and they're about 18 inches thick they're perfectly rectangular on the top but this big sort of domed base to them so they they are they weigh a ton they had a big lifting a big um you know mini crane thing to lift them uh and obviously they're designed to to stay put and uh thousands of tourists feet and floods so yeah obviously yeah, they've, they've thought about this a fair bit and and put in presumably the domed bottom so they can be leveled out i, I would imagine when, so when yeah that's put right in and yeah that's amazing it's, it's fascinating wow. yeah so yeah uh, yeah maybe there's some more to come I, I shot a ton of uh just vlog style video while i was there so we're there's a second channel idea for you please. well yes absolutely uh, uh, uh when retirement beckons you've been a lot of times haven't you so we've been a lot yeah this is that was our 20 21st i think and i think yeah we're, we're going again later in the year as well so uh, we we'll spend a bit more time there so there can't be that many youtubers in the uk who have been to venice that many times that could who who know the city well enough to to get around with our map yeah. together, you know? To, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we'll we'll, well see. We'll see. I, I would watch that definitely. Uh, but yes, other than that, yeah, thrilled to be back naturally. Yeah. And are you uh, are you straight back into it or? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I was fielding emails while I was away. Uh, they've got sort of <laughs> sounds like they've got better Wi-Fi than you have to be honest. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's not hard. <laughs> um, in this little tourist apartment, uh, so I was fielding a few emails while I was away. Uh, funny thing, uh, I think we mentioned was it in the last podcast or the one before? You you did your uh, IKEA bookcase. Oh, the Joiner versus IKEA costing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Joiner versus IKEA. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I, I I thought that was really interesting because I. And you you talked about the process that you would have gone through to make that. And I, I would have done it a completely different way, which is really interesting, as, as an aside. But I've got, I think I mentioned it in the last podcast, I've got my interior designers. Um, they questioned a, a quote on one of those things. And I've, I've got one of these things to do. So 36 mil square little spindly legs and and the same section tabletop with a drawer and a, and a bottom uh, shelf on it as a couple of little bedside tables and uh, they confirmed it while I was away when I came back on Sunday I started having a, a proper look at it because you know the weekend I try and avoid doing work at weekends but I knew I had to get it through this week and it's only a couple of little bedside tables and I mean the, the drawings they sent didn't make any sense so and it's all I can never get them on the phone because they travel a lot and it's all done through email and of course, if you get one of them replying on their phone, it comes from a different account, so the thread gets split up, and it's just been a comedy of errors. There's, I mean, strictly between you and I, it looks to me like what they're doing is is lifting somebody else's, else's design off a website from elsewhere, altering it slightly, uh, and you know, putting it out as as their own. Yeah, an interpretation, probably we'd say. Uh, but there was a, it's a it's a little sort of. Uh, it, almost impossible to describe, but a, a, a skinny, skinny leg thing with a drawer at the top and a bottom shelf. And at the side, it had two bars. And it turns out, after a lot of back and forth, I, w- I, I was questioning the placement of the sidebar because on the drawing, it didn't have the drawer in. And when it was centrally placed, if you like, between the top and the bottom shelf, you got a sidebar in the centre. But when you've got a 120mm drawer in there, it looks really awkward. So I just, you know, not unreasonably, before I start making this thing, ask the question, are you sure that's where you want it placed? Yes, equidistant. And I, okay. And I started doing it. I thought, no, this, this is crazy. You know, just just to confirm one more time, what do you mean the sidebar? Uh, and it turns out they've sent me the wrong drawings. They sent me some other drawings completely. No. And they were saying, oh, well, the dimensions are all on the all on the drawings. Well, they are for the... 
flipping one with the sidebar and with little little ball you feet on it as well, which are thirty five mil high, which are the same section as the as the legs, and they've changed those as well, so that affects everything else. And you know, it's like, gee, where's every every single communication with them raises more questions or contradicts what they've said before? Uh, and annoyingly, these are these are the guys who used to be just around the corner from me, so I could just jump in the van or, you know, 10-minute walk and, and go and ask them. They've moved out to a swanky offices in Chelsea. So, you know, it's not that far in terms of distance, but it's about an hour away in terms of time now. So uh, I'm not popping around there to have a chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think finally we've got a, a, oh, a design man. decision off them. But, yeah, that could all have gone so wrong so easily. And I'm so glad I queried it. You could have done the full – yeah, you could – Wow. You imagine that, yeah, nightmare. And if if you build what they'd asked you to build because they'd sent you the wrong yeah. plans and then it's presented on, it then. to them along with the bill, um, what who who would be liable yeah. there? That's an interesting yeah. one. Whether they'd honour it, I don't and know. Just pay you know. for a thing that they didn't yeah. want at that point or whatever. So anyway, all all that fannying about to, to be blunt has has meant that I didn't start it until yesterday. I've got two little side jobs to do. I've got another alcove unit two alcove units that are going to make uh, and paint. And I'm trying to get that fitted before the end of the month. So, and of course we've got Easter next weekend. So uh, it's, it's getting a bit tight. <laughs> I'm going to be working the weekend. Got, yes. uh, and the other thing, of course, just to cap it all, unusually, normally these things, I do them and they go off to be sprayed. Oh, could you, could you spray this in eggshell? Uh, yeah. Okay. So gave the price for spraying it. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Uh, they've specified some swanky paint type, uh, Edward Bulmer. Never heard of it before. Okay. It can be sprayed, but only HVLP. It's a it's an oil based water paint. Uh, no, that doesn't make any sense. So I rang them up. Uh, oh no, you, you need to treat it like an oil based paint. Okay, well I can't spray it. See if I can get it color match. No, nobody will color match it because it's a you know it's not on anybody's system. It's an oddball small maker. Uh, okay, so buy a pot of their paint, 93 quid for two and a half litres. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. 24-hour drying time. <laughs> nice, okay. So there's uh, how many coats? <clears throat> at least three. So there's three days your workshop's three days. completely yep. tied up. Just nightmare, wow. nightmare, nightmare, nightmare. Anyway, so ha- happy times. Will it, will it look any different to normal, the paint that you would have chosen? It's actually a really nice colour, but I can't believe it. it's going to make a scrap of difference to anything. Um, That's crazy. But, that, well, if they're happy to pay it, uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Well, so, well, OK, hey. how would you have made that Kallax unit then? That, that's an interesting one. Well, what I what I've, I, and to be honest, it's... Uh, it's occupied me for a couple of days. I was thinking about it while I was away as well. Uh, what I've opted to do, because what, what I effectively want are straight sticks of they've specced 35 mil square section. No, I mean, no, I mean for the IKEA one that I had on the video. Oh, for the IKEA one. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, same thing to be honest, because that was was that 40 mil 36 section, or was that? 36, yeah. okay, well, there you go. Uh, I've opted to build these these legs as, as two 18s and then a 6 mil capping piece on either side. Uh, and I probably would have done something similar to for those shelves, but do... Uh, 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 just do a 6 mil, yeah, 6 mil skin. Yeah. So you make a ladder, a ladder frame up. But I, w- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pin it. If I'm painting it, I would never, I would never pin on the face. I'd just glue it and... and Clamp it or weight it down. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I would. I think I said just biscuit it, and um, I, I don't think right, I said okay. pin yeah. it. Um, don't think I did. Um, All right, but um, but yeah. So you so you effectively make a hollow, a hollow. You make a sort of ladder frame, and then and then put a skin either side. Uh, a ladder frame. Let me think. You've okay, so this. you got a. So if it's two eighteens. Uh, yep. To make the thirty six, uh, then no. What I'd probably do is rip eighteen down to twenty four, or or buy some twenty four, twenty five mil, and then and then skin it either, and then you make a ladder out of that to the right size, and then you just put a, it's like a floating shelf kind of thing, but you, then you you skin it 
either side instead of top and bottom with six mil. Uh, Does that make sense? Uh, I'm looking at it now, and because uh, what I said is because basically the top is thirty six. Yeah. The top and bottom are thirty six, and the sides are thirty six, and then all the internal shelves are eighteen. Right. Um, so if you wanted to make that exact unit, what I said is to make the sides out of 12, but... Uh, uh, three twelves, uh, okay, yeah. Lattice yeah. framework of three. So basically an outer skin of 12, an inner lattice of just the odd 12 mil support just to keep the weight down, and then the uh, the the other side of 12. Um, so basically three twelves, but the, the inner is more or less hollow. Yeah. And do that for... Everything basically, but you would have to have capping pieces um, on the edge to cover yeah. the edge, which is another whole issue. Yes, um, and then just eighteen for the eighteen, either biscuited or joint um, dominoed in for the internal frame. Yeah, sorry, this is really bad, badly drawn. Um, where am I? Uh, yeah, so basically that kind of thing. Yeah. But that, that is 18 mil thick, but 24 mil deep. Yeah, so you make up a ladder frame like that, and then you put a 6 mil skin on either side. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got you. Yeah. Uh, and you position the, the ladder the ladder rungs so that the 18 mil shelves will fit into them. Yes. So you're not trying to fix into 6 mil. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you could definitely do that. So basically 6 mil sides instead of 12 mil. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then a thicker internal framework. Yeah. No, you could definitely do that. It, it's that's more or less the same as what I said. And, but, uh, but yeah, but you you were doing three three twelves. Yes, instead of yeah yeah. Um, but either way, it would still cost like seven hundred quid versus forty quid or whatever. <laughs> which is yeah. yeah, absolutely no yeah no no uh, uh, no arguments there. Uh, yes, uh, and again these these little you know two little uh, bedside tables aren't. Uh, uh, are similar kind of money to be honest. So, yeah, that, that that's, hey that's crazy, crazy, it, especially for that. Is it for the bedside tables that matched color match paint you were talking about? Yeah, that, yep. that's what that's getting used for. Wow! It turns out it's for the same client that I did the the big job for last year. So uh, oh, okay, uh, okay, all explained. They're well yeah. funded. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> However, it does mean that the paint finish has got to be spot on. So, if that's yeah. what they want, then uh, so someone put a comment on one of my Instagram posts for the the job that I've been on this week, and it's um, a, a big. Mm. Your this was your oak uh, oak topped alcove cabinet. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a big. Um, it, it should look quite nice once it's finished. Yeah, I, I saw what you put on Instagram. Actually, you, I, I thought you were really lucky to get those nice straight walls. The way that uh, that oak top just oh, slotted man. straight in. <laughs> The, the walls, these are the worst. Not only that, I, I don't think I've posted any photos of it yet, but the floor. Oh, really? Man, the, the, from one side of the room to the other side is probably a three to four inch drop. Nice. I mean, on, on the right-hand alcove, for just from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, it's a two inch drop. Um, but most of the drop is on on the right hand side, <laughs> so it's like, well, how do you deal with that? Because obviously, yeah. the only thing you can do is scribe the skirt into the floor. Um, there's not a lot else yeah. you can you can do. And and uh, I was saying, you know, it is going to be fairly obvious because for years and years, the whole right hand side of your room has been lopsided. It's noticeable, yeah. No one's noticed because everything's been lopsided. Your skirting's lopsided. Your every. But now you've got nice, perfectly straight alcoves going in, and that's going to make your floor. It's going to make it pretty obvious that your floor is is out. Um, and, and well, we've just opted for scribing the skirting to the floor, and there's, there's not a lot else you can do. I mean, it's a an eighteen fifties house. It's not going anywhere, and it's probably just yeah. settled over the last coming on for two hundred years. You know, so. Um, but yeah, it, it, it. in two hundred years' time, Andy, when when somebody takes out your archive units, they'll admire your craftsmanship. Well, and uh, it'd be nice if they admire it while it's still there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been a a big install, and um, the it's solid oak tops and solid oak shelves in the units because there's like open shelves. You'll you'll see it on my Instagram at some point. Yeah. 
And um, uh, sorry, what's your Instagram? Gus with Handyman on Instagram. Gus with Handyman on Instagram. Uh, and you can follow the podcast as well at Measuring Up Podcast on Instagram as well, uh, or me uh, at Ten Minute Workshop too on Instagram. We we post a lot of stuff that's uh, appropriate to Instagram, pictures and short videos. So uh, yeah, yes, good good stuff. Always worth a follow. A couple of people have said, have, have I have I got an Instagram for my joinery business? And it's like, no, I I, I haven't got time yeah. to manage that many different yes. Instagram accounts. So everything just goes onto the. The Goffith Handyman one is basically my Instagram account for my YouTube channel. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. And everything just goes on on there, um, just because I haven't got time to, to do that many different Instagram accounts. And um, so, yeah, it'll go on there. And, and someone had mentioned, um, why didn't you just put MDF, um, oak veneered MDF in for the tops? And it would have made life a, a lot easier. And it's like, well, the client wanted solid oak and they were quite happy to pay for solid oak yeah um and it's like i install what the client asks for and absolutely they, yeah is, is specifically a thing that they wanted in fact they wanted the whole thing to be made out of oak even the painted bits and i managed to persuade them to have <laughs> the painted bits made out of mdf but they didn't originally want mdf coming back to i don't know if it's anything that down to the whole scaremongery <laughs> <clears throat> clickbaity you know m- nonsense clickbaity myths about mdf nonsense which we've had a, a we have yeah follow up about that which we'll cover in, in a bit um but yeah they wanted the whole thing to be solid painted wood and it's like well i was saying i will if you want it'll be a lot more expensive and the finish yeah. won't be as good because you know you're always going to be struggling against the grain of the wood and um your decorators are probably going to charge more for prep um the decorating side of it and the prep and everything like that as well um mdf for the painted bits is the most sensible material to go for but we're settled on a combo of uh solid oak for all the visible wood bits and um painted mdf for everything else did you were you able to help them out with with Painters and decorators, because I think last time you said that they, they'd they been given all kinds of uh-huh. nonsensical <laughs> advice in inverted commas from uh, painters and decorators who um, beginning quotes from. No, I'd, I checked with my sprayers and they don't really do on-site stuff. So, um, and uh, th- they ended up managing to find a decorator who came back with an amazing quote, which... Uh, what, worryingly th- cheap. Th- th- worryingly cheap mm. like they're quoting 500 quid to do the whole room wow. like everything now this is a, a big victorian you know all the original cornicing like really twiddly stuff that you can only do with a brush and all this sort of thing and they're quoting 500 quid to decorate the whole room ceilings walls all the woodwork all the prep um and the alcoves and I said I would have charged 500 just to paint the alcove units. You know, that, I mean, it's at least two days' work to, to yeah, absolutely. paint the alcoves. Um, and, yeah, the, the decorator seems happy enough to do the whole room for that. And I said, well, are, are you sure they're quoting for the alcoves? Because that's a big job. You know, you've got every single cupboard, every shelf top and bottom, all the backs, yeah. insides. Everything needs to be done. You're going to have to, like mask off all the oak bits to make sure you don't get paint on the nice solid oak bits that you can't remove. I mean, the shelves are removable, but there's bits like the lower shelf is part of the carcass. So you can't yeah, take sure. that out. Uh, Gee, they, they can't take the, the tops out. Um, so they're going to have to be careful not to damage the tops. Yeah. And, and and of course, as, as we know, doing work in other people's houses, the potential for mishap, uh, you've got to be so careful Oh God. when you're doing any, you're just moving your gear in and out. But if you're painting, yeah. yeah, the potential for getting paint on for you know carpets, <laughs> curtains, clothes, uh, almost anything uh, is, is horrific. I was kind of playing through my mind, you know, if if it's kind of preparing for the worst, not being pessimistic, yeah. but just having it in the back of your mind. If something goes horribly wrong, yeah, what's it going to cost me as a business? And I was trying to get my head round because the the tops, uh, the solid oak tops, they've been a big job to make um because obviously you've got to 
do all the panel glue ups, get perfectly smooth, source wood in the first place that's flat enough to actually glue up. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I mean, just sourcing the wood for this project took a full yeah, day because you were running around between uh, different suppliers weren't you because i was everywhere yeah i mean i was at for best part of two hours at the oak supplier picking out the oak that i wanted and with the what, leaving all the bad stuff for somebody else yeah yeah well yes <laughs> i've come in after it, you yeah i know <laughs> some of it you just couldn't have made anything with you know you it, you would have been planing it down to literally nothing by the time it was uh, do you buy it in prepared or this is finished but they're still the the trouble is that you know what timber yards are like they're not centrally heated houses yeah, yeah. uh they they're not even um, i mean my workshop's not perfectly dry but it's more dry than a timber merchant so there's a certain amount of yeah checking and twisting that happens just when it goes from the timber merchant to my workshop just naturally yeah of course. and then as we've seen by my trusty computer desk here <laughs> yes. get it into a centrally heated house and it turns into a banana shaped piece of wood you know and you, you've got to cater for all of that in the design um and uh yeah so these tops i was thinking you know i've been able to do this build in parallel where i've been able to do the jointing of the the tops and do the gluing up and leave them to dry while i've been getting on with something else but if i had to make those tops from scratch, yeah, on on its own as a single job, yeah. I reckon each top would be five hundred quid, yeah, ju- just for the tops, uh, because you're looking minimum, bare minimum, two days, and what I'm having to do here, basically, it's it's twenty mil finished oak, mm-hmm. solid wood top, but then with a forty mil capping on the front, which makes it look like a forty mil top if that makes sense so it's like an l capping around the the front edge so it makes it look like a really beefy yeah. solid oak top but that would have been like crazily expensive to buy the wood that that thick but in order to put that capping on i can't do the capping yeah until i've scribed it to the wall because i can't fit the capping because you don't know where the front edge is going to be yeah because yeah. you don't know where the front edge is going to be and i need to clamp the capping in place so i can't clamp the capping in place while yeah, yeah. it's in so what i need to do is take the whole top to site template it cut it to size get it a perfect fit which you saw on the instagram thing yeah um take it away get all that perfect take it away back to the workshop Make and biscuit in or or domino in the the front capping piece. Yeah, clamp all that up while it's in the workshop because it's just easier to do that in the shop than it would be to do it on site. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Do, do you have any tools that you just hate using on site? Clamps drive me nuts. Clamps. So I mean, how do you carry them? Yeah, I've, I've taken to putting them in a big, uh, you know, folding crate, but they're, they're just such a pain. It's like you know screw organization is so so complicated and difficult uh, so many different size clamps uh to take with you on a job it's just maddening i've got a great big hold all that i use for like my smaller kind of irwin quick clamp type stuff all goes in this big hold all mm. but then my big sash clamps i almost never take to sight anything that needs those i almost always do that in the workshop um, but I hate using my biscuit jointer on site. All right. I, d- I don't know what it is. It's just, I find for the sort of stuff that I use the biscuit jointer for, it's just so much easier to do it in the workshop. Right. Um, where I can properly clamp stuff to my assembly bench and get it like really stable and, yeah. and all that sort of thing. So I tend to try and do all of the biscuit, even all the slots and everything, even if I'm using slots on site. Yeah. Sometimes, obviously, you can't get away with it. There's, there's the odd one that you're going to have to do while you're on site. Um, but it's one of those tools I very, very rarely take to yeah. site. Same with always- the domino, actually. I, I, I tend to think of the domino as being a workshop tool rather than a site tool. Yeah. Um, although, I, you know, I've done it and it works really well because the dust collection is really good. Uh, but I still think of it as a as more of a workshop tool. Yeah, yeah, same here. So, so yeah, so those tops... They would be if if they get damaged, and at the moment, one of them is completely done and on site. I've got the second one, the capping piece is gluing up 
in the workshop at the minute, and I'm taking it there right. this afternoon. So we're going to cut this short, and you're going to sh- scoot off. And then I'm scooting l- off to do morning. the final little bits and pieces, get the the right-hand alcove worktop fitted, and then get the cable access holes put in, um, last bits of sanding and and just finishing touches, door handles and all that sort of thing. So yeah, a couple yeah, yeah. of hours left. All the fiddly little bits and pieces that take take time. Yeah, yeah. and um, but yeah, if anything went wrong with you know the painter dropping a pot of paint on it or anything and i'll i'll be oiling them because i'm paranoid about leaving them leaving them as bare wood bare wood you go god yeah, that'd be nice so, so at least if i oil them then they're, they're pretty much as protected as they're going to get when the decorators are there but even then yeah there's a risk well is it safe masking them off when the oil's only two days old is there a risk that it could yeah absolutely damage the oil the or yeah, yeah and uh, but yeah, if if you had to make those from scratch as a separate job, it would cost a fortune. But it's what the clients asked for, and yeah, um, they, they do touch wood. Once it's it's not done yet, I'm not going to say it will look nice until the job's finished. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, from the little bits we've seen uh, on Instagram and, and what you've posted, it's uh, it's looking very good. I, I tell you the one the one thing about this job, it has been the dream working environment because yeah. the whole room's getting decorated ah, okay. the carpets are getting ripped out and they just said you can make as much mess in this room as you want um the carpet's going in the bin we've they've, they've left the carpet down just because there's a quite a nice wood floor underneath right. although they're, they're putting carpets back in so um but they've left the carpet down just to protect the wood floor that's there and they've just said you can make as much mess as you want and and it's like oh Thank the Lord, because the scribing has been phenomenal. Scri- uh, like just the amount of scribing for yeah. all the floating shelves and for the tops and and everything else has been yeah that that would have been a challenge on the, yeah, a lot of work this collection front yeah. How long have you been on the uh, on the install for? The install's just been this week, and okay, I had a small uh, balls up with it yesterday in that. It's one of these jobs where I measured it up best part of two months ago and then uh, did all of the um, – and it's a bit, it's outside my normal area. I don't normally travel that far, so it's one of those jobs where I've got to take like everything, including the kitchen sink, to make sure that I've not mm. – I haven't made trips back to the workshop. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, well, there was a daft thing the other night where I've only got one decent dust mask like with the removable filters and stuff. Right. And um, and you've changed those filters regularly, have you? Well, I blow them out with a blower. It's fine. <laughs> and uh, and um, I left it at the customer site, and I forgot that I had loads of bits of cutting up of MDF to do in the uh, workshop when I got back. Yeah. So I didn't have a dust mask um, in, in the workshop, and um, – it was like, oh, do I nip out the screw fix and just pick up some disposable ones? And it was, I must have, and I just didn't have any other da- dust masks kicking about anywhere. And uh, so I had to do all this cutting of MDF with no mask, and my throat was killing us that, that night. Yeah. Um, I had the air cleaner on and stuff. Yeah. And table saw or track saw? Mostly table saw, a little bit on the track saw, uh, but it was nearly all table saw. And the dr- dust extraction on the table saw is pretty good. It it gets probably eighty ninety percent of the dust, but there's, it doesn't get rid of the fine stuff that, yeah. that that goes up into the air, and even even with the air cleaner on, um, and yeah, that night I, I was regretting that decision. But it's one of those things when you're working miles away from your workshop, and then you accidentally leave stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been the the dream work environment of just being able to have everything set up and left as a, a mini workshop in the customer's Fantastic. house, you know, jobs like that, I would normally be setting up outside. Yeah, just of course. Of sheer quantity of dust. Do you have a, a good dust? Uh, what, what's dust collection like on your jigsaw? Uh, virtually non-existent. You know, it's, it's, it's okay, but you, I don't think any jigsaw has particularly good dust collection. No, I wasn't sure if, um, if a solution had been developed for, Jigsaws, yeah. Not really. It's a mine. Mine's an old uh, Festool one, uh, and I, I got. I, I don't use a jigsaw much, and uh, but when I do, you know, I want it to be. I want the dust collection to be as good as possible. 
and it was it's it's not yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Just by the nature of where the where the blade is and how it works, it's never going to be fantastic. I mean, you'll see on that Instagram post for the the template one where I pan across, and you'll see the amount of sawdust that was on the floor. Oh, yeah, I saw. And yeah. that's just that's just <laughs> from the jigsaw and all that. the scribing. That's um, not from any other tool. Uh, and yeah, I, I wasn't sure if there's any way around that really, but yeah. Do you scribe upside down um, with a jigsaw? Generally, oh, it's going to be shock horror at this, but generally, no. I tend to use the clean cut blades and scribe the right way up. Okay. My jigsaw, um, and it's a Makita, and it's it's a decent jigsaw, but the way the handle is on it, it's really awkward to use upside down. I've been thinking of getting a different one, like, is your Festool one got like the kind of stubby handle? Which doesn't go all the way around the top of your grip. It's a it's a body grip. They call yeah, it. yeah, so yeah, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't sort of have a handle at all. It just you grip the body. Yeah, because I think they're a bit easier to do upside down. They are. Yes, they're definitely better for using that way. Uh, I actually just prefer them. Uh, I prefer the the body grip style jigsaw. Yeah, I say I don't don't use them much, but uh, but no, I've I found it. I mean, even doing the scribes on the solid oak, I'm not getting any chip out or anything. Yeah, good. Using a, a clean cut blade the right way round. Pendulum action off yeah. on high speed, um, and absolutely fine. I'm not getting any blowout or anything like that. So mm, cool. Um, at, at, you know, if you're doing melamine and stuff like that, you've really got no option. Even even with a clean cut blade on melamine, yeah, you you get the chip out unless you do it upside down. Yeah, you can get you can get down cut blades, but they're yeah, that's what I mean. So I, I use the, the clean cut, uh, the down cut blade. Uh, I mean, they're they're okay, clean cut. Yeah, uh, yeah, the Bosch clean cut. Um, it's got the little R. That's the one yeah. after the model number, and it, it's mm. but uh, with those on on solid oak, I don't get any any blowout with the the down cut blades. Um, but yeah, on melamine there wouldn't be. But I tend not to. Use, I very very rarely use. Melamine. And on MDF, it makes no difference. What about you? Do you scribe upside down? Or? What do I do? Yeah, I, I, generally speaking, I try it. Uh, it it's, I, I don't do that much. Um, uh, and what I tend to try and do is get it as close as can, uh, as close as I can, the jigsaw scribing, and then plane it back. Yeah. Uh, my scribes are usually, usually thin MDF, so it's pretty easy to do. Although I did once take a, a little bandsaw on site. Uh, sorry, I scribed, uh, scribed, scribed the scribes, yeah, marked the scribes, and then took them back to the workshop uh, and cut them on a bandsaw. It was so easy, right? Yeah, <laughs> it was so, I bet so you. easy. I bet you. Yeah, uh, and then you know, close, close to the line, and then and then just plane it back on site. Yeah, well, I normally do a slight undercut um, and and just angle, bevel the cut slightly, yeah, and then just ease it back to the line um, with a plane. But I found. On this oak, I was getting literally zero, like tear out or chip out, yeah. um, and I, I managed to get completely to the line. That fit that you saw on Instagram. Yeah. That was first attempt, no planing or anything, and and straight in. Wow. Um, which, as I say, normally, um, I, I normally try and plane it back, but I, it was a new blade and it was behaving itself, and I was feeling cocky, yeah. and I thought, well, go for it. Let's take a gamble with this six hundred quid worktop. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it's been a, a nice environment to work in. The install, it, it, oh yes. So I was saying about a balls up with it. Measured the whole thing out a couple of months ago, and did the whole thing on SketchUp, which I'll be doing a video on at some point because I've, I've, I've filmed the SketchUp thing, but I just haven't had time to edit it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> sort of our lives, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I've made the worktop, uh, obviously, around my SketchUp plans. And uh, I'd allowed loads of overhang on the front because generally what I do on something like this is I make the top far too big. I then do all the scribing and then I work out how wide the front has to be and then I just track saw off the front. Yep, yep, same. Um, because I find that is a much safer bet than hoping that you get your scribe right and your front perfectly lines up. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can get away with that for floating shelves and stuff, but on, on something like this where I have zero margin for error and it's going to create a week's worth of work if I make a yeah. mistake, I'd rather get all the back and side scribes perfect and then I'll worry about the front. Yeah. 
Good, good plan. Good plan. Yeah. So I allow plenty overhang at the front. Well, on the right hand alcove, I didn't cater for how bowed in the back wall was, mm. and it was bowed in further than what I'd allowed oh, no. on, on the front. It was like a four set, something like a four centimeter. I think I allowed like a two centimeter overhang at the front, um, and it was largely down to what the thickness of the board the width of the boards was wow. and it's like well do i do a three board glue up or do i need to make it a four board glue up and i thought i'll take the gamble on a three that gives us two centimeter overhang yeah. and yeah the walls bowed in by four centimeters at the at the back which would have meant i would have had a uh, best part of um well coming on for a two centimeter gap yeah. in in certain places at the back and it was like oh yeah. so i had to take the whole thing back to the workshop i think i think the expansion of the wood isn't going to cover it's that it's not going it, to cover it? two centimeters yeah, so i had yeah. to go take it back add an extra section on yeah um wait for that to dry take it back to site scribe it take it back to the workshop do the front piece. Yeah. Uh, and the trouble is, the, these are the kind of things that you don't see, you don't find until you're no, there. No, and, and it's one of the, since the job's further away, normally I would have done a bit of a more detailed site survey between the original quote. Yeah. But since it's so far away, I thought, well, I've got pretty decent measurements. But what I didn't have a measurement were, of was the bow of the walls. Um, and it, it was further than I'd allowed for. It was just crazy. Yeah. And you can't really template until you know exactly how high no, the cabinets it, are going. Exactly, in exactly. Because you can't. There's no point in templating the wall, you know, lower or higher than the. Yeah, than the, I mean, you could, but it's a it's a massive chew on, especially at the point that you don't even know you've got the job. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, from my initial quoting measure up, uh, I should really have gone back and done a bit of a more detailed site survey but yeah. that just um didn't happen Time. and it add, and it added a day on basically to to fix that but uh, it was only on one one side so i would have had it done by in 4 days i would have had the uh, the, the whole install done but that doesn't cater for the week it took a, a full week of prep for this job yeah. um making the the tops making the cabinets making the doors uh, so it's best part of a two week job, basically. Yeah. So, wow. uh, but yes, nearly done. Touch wood. Good. Fingers crossed. A couple of hours, and I'll I'll be done on that one. What are we chatting about Evidence. today? Well, so many things. Can I, can I just say you're looking very smart today, Andy? Is that uh, is that a new a new t shirt oh, you've got? That, not, is that a new? No, I'm, I've got my. It's just my black jumper. I think maybe I've normally got a t shirt on. I've, I've just got. A, I, I thought for a second there it was. Uh, I thought for a second there it was the it was the new uh, measuring up podcast t shirt that you were wearing. Perhaps I'm mistaken. It, it's not, but. Um, maybe you can enlighten us as to to where. Well, we 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 have a Teespring store, without many things in it, but you can buy, if you choose to, uh, a finely honed and beautifully uh, designed uh, measuring up podcast T-shirt. Uh, where do you love measuring up podcasts, Andy? I'd, well, I love measuring up podcasts in a living room when I'm installing alcove units. That sounds like a very good plan. I, I, I love them in the kitchen. I love podcasts in the kitchen or the van or sometimes in the workshop. Uh, you know, uh, some people might love measuring up in the truck. Uh, you know, it depends on, on what you fancy. Uh, we, we have a, a, a T-shirt available uh, for sale through Teespring, through our Teespring store with all those wonderful witty slogans on it. Uh, uh, go and take a look and buy one if you fancy it. There we are. That was a good sales pitch, wasn't it? If you go to measuringuppodcast.com slash teespring, we'll put a link from there. There we go. So, yes, that, that was fun to do. Uh, interesting. I've, I've been putting a few bits and pieces. I know you've got a tea, Teespring store as well for the Gus, uh, Gus for Thunder Man, uh, and I've got one now for 10 Minute Workshop too. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting learning curve putting stuff on Teespring, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's very clunky. Yeah, Teespring is a is a print on demand sort of outfit, uh, which ships globally. I think so. You know, very very much uh, an ideal uh, print partner for this kind of stuff, because uh, otherwise we're you, we're shelling out a ton of money on on stock in many different sizes. So uh, oh, it's it's just impossible. I, I mean, to to keep. Any well, 
just keeping that many different designs and different sizes and different styles and like women's t-shirts and men's t-shirts and different colors you just couldn't do it and then catering for global shipping and all that sort of thing so teespring yeah it would be impossible to do so so teespring do a great job so our our new t-shirt that's it it is strictly limited edition and you've got just over a week to get your hands on one and then it'll be gone so you've got until the end of april so from the first of may you'll no longer be able to get that t-shirt anymore it's strictly limited edition and then at some point, a new design might pop up at some point. But that particular design, you've got uh, till the end of April 2019. If you're listening to this in the future, then uh, you've you've missed your chance, I'm afraid. So uh, hop on to measuringuppodcast.com slash Teespring. That's T-W-E-S-P-R-I-N-G. Yeah. And you will find a link to uh, the Teespring store from there. Fantastic. And it all helps to keep this show on the road. It does, and indeed. all of your help from Patreon obviously helps with that as well, which is amazing. So a lot of new Patreon supporters have, have come in and started supporting the show. So thank you and a massive welcome to everyone. Of course, if you are supporting via Patreon, you get access to the special secret um, after show as well, which is always a, a yeah. bit of a laugh. All good stuff. All good stuff. So... What else have we been looking at? Oh, um, we did get someone. I'm not sure if it's in here. But we got someone mentioning that they'd had some kickback because of the article someone had um, read. Oh, yes. Now, I don't know where that came in. I don't think it was through to our, our email, was it? It was... Uh, I haven't got it in front of us. Uh, no, but, yeah, neither. someone saying that a customer had read the absolute nonsense article about mdf uh being dangerous um and they've been getting kickback from customers not wanting it in their houses which is absolutely insane um where do you even start with that sort of nonsense really yeah it's something that that um we've we've talked about extensively on this show we'll not go into it today it's just crazy but it is interesting to hear that people are starting to kind of feel this at their uh, we, end at, at the call face. We we did say as well when when that article came out that it's the kind of thing that's going to linger. You know, it'll it'll hang around for a long time. People will continue to refer to it, and here we are. You know, it's coming true. Uh, it's not making life any easier for anybody, and it's a, a, a massively exaggerated risk. So mm, difficult. Very difficult. It is, and I, I know some of the big manufacturers have been putting out very good messages to try and dispel a lot of these myths because it literally is into the realms of your anti-vaccination clans, and it it is complete yeah. mythology. But going from all the scientific information that's out there, it is no more dangerous than any other wood dust which you need to protect yourself from. Yeah, always. You were you were wearing a face mask when you were cutting your oak, weren't you? I absolutely was, and um, I know what my throat would be like if I wasn't wearing a face mask while cutting oak or absolutely. any other yeah. material. So um, MDF, you know, it it releases um, obviously when you're cutting it quite a fine sawdust, and realistically, your body's just going to metabolize that when when you do breathe it in but it does irritate the yeah. throat uh, as does any wood dust absolutely yeah but uh yeah absolutely crazy that based on no scientific evidence whatsoever that we're being told as as joiners and cabinet makers that we can't use this product anymore basically by by customers who are reading madness scaremongery reports um talking to customers how how do you say no to them sometimes? You know, so during the, the course of your career as a as a joiner, carpenter, cabinet maker, whatever, there'll be periods where you'll get offered a job or somebody will want you to do something that you're not happy about. And I'm curious as to how you go about either saying no or turning people down. I've got sort of a, a set of stock phrases. I've had a couple of jobs in this last, um, a couple of inquiries about things in the last uh, week or two from people who 
have asked me to look at things that I don't I don't really do anymore or I'm not really interested anymore. Somebody wanted a a, a front door. They wanted sort of a, a porch enclosing and a front door moving forward, so a new frame and front door, all that sort of thing. And it's, I've done it in the past, and I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to I just want to do the the little cabinet making jobs and that kind of thing. That's too too builderish for me, a bit too carpenterish. And um, there's a few other little bits and pieces. And and you know how how would you go about saying no to somebody like that? Like that. What's what's your sort of stock phrase? Um, I think generally, I, I I just point them in the direction of my website and just kind of say, "This is the sort of stuff that I do." That's that's just it's not the sort of thing I do, and mm. it depends really. I, I think I've now managed to get my website so focused in in a particular area um, that. I'd, I mean, I do still get the odd inquiry for can you, you know, fit twenty doors in a house and all this sort of thing, and it's like no, no, it's just awful job, and um, it, it it's just kind of getting the message across that no, I'm a cabinet maker, mm. I build custom units, built ins, and all that sort of thing. Um, generally what I just say to people is, you know, I do bespoke stuff yeah, and, and, and I do bespoke builds and, and things like that. Um, but one of my other things is that a lot of these jobs tend to be like what you're describing there. Really, it's a two man job, you know, it's, it's a big job to do by yourself, um, in any kind of reasonable time frame. So generally I just say, you know, um, it is just me working on my own in, in my little workshop. Mm. Um, and that sort of thing's more of a, a two man job. You might be able to find a bigger joinery company. You might want to take it on or a, a building yeah. company or, or something like that, but it's just, it's not the sort of stuff I do. What about you? How, how do you, uh, I, yeah, very, very similar. Refer them to the website. Frighteningly, some people still call you, even though they've seen the sort of stuff you do on the website. Um, but typically it's along the lines of, you know, thank you very much for the inquiry. Uh, either you can throw in the fact that you've caught me at a particularly busy time and I won't be able to get to see it for, you know, many months in the future. But generally speaking, I, I take much the same sort of thing uh, along the lines of the, it, it just really isn't what I do. I do cabinet making, fitted furniture, uh, made to measure bookcases and alcove cabinets and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, and like yourself, to say you know, for this porch door thing, it's a bit more of a, a a bigger job than I take on these days. And you might want to look for a, a bigger firm who can help you out. I got had a, a spectacular phone call yesterday, actually. Uh, phone phone goes. I don't very rarely get phone calls. I've, I've taken your trick and I've kept my phone on silent these days. So you know, I have to be really aware when it's buzzing or whatever. Uh, phone goes. Didn't recognise the number pick it up anyway uh, and this frightfully proper chap bellowing down the phone I, I mean i won't i won't do it but it absolutely literally i had to hold the phone away from her face away from her, from my ear hello is that billy millard you're a carpenter i need a cabinet that's re- repairing is that can you do it i said no i'm afraid of what oh, speak up i can't hear you huh I said, no, I'm very sorry. I, 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 I can't hear you, bloody thing. Look, I've, I've phoned half a dozen people this morning and they're all turning me down. I've got this 18th century <laughs> <laughs> cabinet that's fallen apart and I did it repairing. Is it the sort of thing you do? And I, so I say for the you know fourth time, no, I'm very sorry. It isn't the sort of thing I do. You need a furniture restorer to do that kind of thing. And what? <laughs> I, I can't hear you. Is it yes or no? I said, said, no, I'm very sorry. It's not the kind of thing I do. Oh, you should have said so then. He hung up. Oh, <laughs> my lordy. <laughs> Absolutely classic. I wish I'd recorded it, but I suppose there are <clears throat> legal questions about re- recording d- conversations. I do still see yeah. um, a- across the board um, people just really struggling to find people to do the work because – yeah, I don't know if there's just less of us doing this sort of work, or 
um, whether there's more work out there or whether there's lots of work out there, but it's not very good quality work and not worth doing. I, yeah, or maybe we're just we're just getting a bit more choosy about it, like uh, other guys like us are getting a bit more particular about what we do. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, um, I know people listen to the show who who have said, you know, the phone's not ringing and we're really struggling to, to bring business in. And um, we've covered it off in earlier episodes where we've talked about, you know, things like Instagram and yeah. Uh, yeah, social media in general and having a decent website and making sure that you're coming up on SEO and using things like Google My Business or um, Google P- Places and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, I, even with, as I've said many times, even with a message on my website say, saying I'm booked up mm. for the whole of 2019. In fact, look, here's an email that came in yesterday. This is like every day I'm getting these sort of inquiries. And it says on my – and let me just – I'll read you word for word what it says on my website. Uh-huh. Right. So on my contact page, um, it says, I'm afraid for larger bespoke builds – I have a waiting list covering most of 2019, so I can't book in any new work until things calm down a bit. Um, If you're an existing customer, drop me an email or text, and I'll try my best to fit you in. Thank you. So I've kind of pre-warned that you can get in touch if you want, but I'm pretty much booked up for the whole year. Yeah. And then just yesterday, oh, here's... Two, another email's just come in. Uh-huh. Uh, so these both came in yesterday. One of them, fitted wardrobes. Uh, hi, I was wondering if you could do two fitted wardrobes in a bedroom, assuming probably not, as you say, you're busy throughout 2019. Thank you. Uh, another one's just come in. Staircase restoration. I have an Edwardian staircase that needs restoring. Is this something you would consider? Are you able to remake or copy spindles? I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, another one from a client who they got me to quote on something before Christmas and they've only just got back to us now. And they've said, can you go ahead? And I've just said, look, really sorry, but I'm completely booked up. Uh And they've just said, well, we're happy to wait. Ah, Your deposit's waiting here for you when you're ready to say, go ahead. And I've been, uh, but you might be waiting for the the whole year. (sighs) And and I'm not advertising anywhere. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not either. Literally, the, my, the only thing I've got is my website. So, and and, and you've got to nail your website. I, I, that is so top of your list because that's, people are going to search on Google. Yeah. Even if they go onto social media, the first thing they're going to do is go over at your website and have a look at your portfolio of work and all that yeah. sort of thing. Do you, do you get your uh – do you get your Google Google Analytics or Google My Business or whatever it is? Yes. Updates your phone. I got mine, got mine the other day. It's like 3,000 views on that. I couldn't believe it, considering I, I, don't, I don't advertise it or promote it at all. You know? Yeah, I don't think mine's quite that high, but obviously you're in London. Have you got yours there handy? Uh, I, that, that's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I don't. Let me have a look. Google My Business here. We, oh, that's just a photo of... So Google My Business is basically where um, you register your business on Google. Yeah. um, And it's kind of connected with Google Maps and everything so that when um, it it shows a a coverage area that you you do and all this sort of thing. I had 870 views in February. Wow. Yeah, performance for February 2019. I had 870 views. Uh, 23 visits to my website, and February's normally quiet. Yeah. You know, so what about you? Uh, mine, I had uh, 2,980 people found me on Google, uh, 74 visits to my website, up 30%. Woo! And four people asked for directions, which is slightly worrying Yeah, because <laughs> they're going to be disappointed. <laughs> there you go. Uh, January, 955 people viewed uh, the listing, 36 visits to the website. Bearing in mind, I only need, well, maximum four to five jobs a month. Absolute tops. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm flat out. Uh, because every job's taking one to two weeks, you know, so to work yeah, it out. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm getting 36 visits to my website every month and I only have to convert maybe a sixth of those into, into jobs, 
Yeah. The the work out there at the minute is just yeah. crazy, but just follow all these things. Go, Google my business. We'll pop a link in the in yeah. the show notes if you're not sure what it is. But that's just one of yeah, between that and just normal SEO search engine optimization, people just finding you via your website. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, even even though we're not actively promoting ourselves and that side of our business in any sort of, you know, proactive advertising kind of way. Yeah. Uh, people people just find you. Yeah. And this isn't people finding us via YouTube and stuff. It's not, don't, no, don't no. think that no, this I, is happening because no one who's visiting via Google My Business even knows that we have YouTube channels. So that that's... No, I, I mean, I, I think the vast majority, well, I know that the vast majority of my customers have no idea that, that I'm on YouTube. No. One or two of them have because, I've, because I've, I've asked if I can shoot bits of video in their homes while I'm doing installs and things. I've, I've never met a customer who knows I'm on YouTube. Never. Um, m- most of my customers don't even watch YouTube. They're just like, oh, no, you know, no. it, it's a, a combination of, oh, what's that? And, oh, that's something they, <laughs> and oh, it's something the kids watch, you know. It, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Good stuff. Um, <sighs> do you do many draws? I try not to. Um, it, it comes up from time to time. I always struggle with pricing them because when you actually cost out how long it takes to make one and to fit one, they end up being. You're starting at around 140, 150 quid a piece. So if you've got a four draw cabinet, you know that's 600 quid plus the cost of the cabinet. Yeah. And you think? Uh, Have you looked into pre-made draw boxes where you can just put your own fronts on? And yeah, I don't like them much. I mean, again, the 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 most of the cabinets I make, uh, most of the drawers are going into cabinets that are oddball sizes. So. Uh, I know you can get custom custom draw boxes made. Uh, I'm not. Other than the fact that there doesn't take your time, I, I don't think there's any saving in terms of costs. No, I mean you would have to design it around the 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 pre-made draw box. And I mean I've heard of cabinet makers who only fit pre-made carcasses. Who they they never really? make the yeah. I've I've heard of loads of cabinet makers who are just like no, it's not worth my while to make the carcass. I'll buy a carcass from a you know, like a, a, effectively a kitchen unit or whatever, yeah. of roughly the right size, and then I'll build everything around that. Um, and plenty who get off the shelf doors as well, and it's like you're basically yes. fitting a kitchen into someone's alcove by the sounds of it. <laughs> but um, if if it works, you know, yeah. I, I can understand well, from yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, a, a, a cost benefit side of things, and and if it does the job. Um, but yeah, it, it's the the drawers are. As you say, they're they're a big job. They're, they're they're a lot of work for something that the customer just assumes it and kind of say, "Oh, and can you add two drawers?" And it's like, "Oh, can you add a thousand yeah, quid onto yeah. the job?" <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd quoted on one job that had, uh, I think it was twenty eight drawers Ooh. in it. She she loves drawers, right. loves drawers, and she wanted a, a dressing room done. Uh, and then you know they got the they got the quote. And it was, oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we could, I really hate asking this, but do you think you'd be able to fit an Ikea unit, <laughs> an Ikea draw unit into that carcass? I said, yeah, sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to build the carcass for you, but I, I, can, I can build the, the cabinet carcass around it, if that's what you want. It's not a problem. However, it uh, looks like that one's fallen by the wayside, as, uh, as some do. So, uh, yes. On, on the flip side, I mean, I've... Uh, a lot of carpenters and and you know bespoke kitchen fitters listen to this show, and a, a couple that I'd come across on Instagram um, that are doing stunning bespoke kitchens. You know where every single component is is handmade. Yeah, and um, I just, when I look at some of these bespoke kitchens, I can't imagine the amount of work that goes into them you know when you when you think of you know how long it takes just to do effectively two alcoves um and and you see some of these kitchens with like you know 30 cabinets and 30 bespoke doors and all 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 sprayed beautifully sprayed and um in fact let's i'll I'll do a quick shout out for a couple because um the there's a couple that I've come across on Instagram. I'll see if I can find okay. them. Well, well, while you're finding those, let me give a quick shout-out to an old pal of mine, um, a guy called Alistair Johnson. 
Uh, Alistair and I have been chatting on email for I uh, well, close to ten years actually. I can't remember how how we came across each other, but he's gone from sort of one man band working on his own uh, to quite a large workshop and lean to spray booth spray shop uh, at, uh, from a, a home based workshop, very very large garage. Uh, and Alistair's been on YouTube for about a year as Freebird Interiors is his, um, is his company. And he's just started, and probably in the last sort of five, six months, something like that, posting more regularly. And he's doing some really, really great work. Um, it came up in conversation. I, we, we've sort of reconnected again recently. We, we so one of those guys, we, we get back in touch periodically and then we chat for a bit and then it, you know, uh, goes away again. But, uh, he was very interested in. I, I posted a few little bits and pieces about the the bit of software editing software I was using on my phone to edit videos, and uh, it, it turns out in conversation that he's built his entire YouTube channel just using a phone. Really? I'd, I'll need. I haven't seen that. I'll- so everything's everything's shot on a phone. Um, he's got a gimbal for it. It's it's sort of first person vlog style. Uh, maker and installation videos. Really, really great stuff. Um, uh, and yeah, his, his business is doing doing uh, doing really well. It's expanding. It's growing. Uh, he wants to move out of his out of his home based workshop and and get premises and all that sort of stuff. And it's it's you know, uh, nice guy, uh, very skilled, great maker. Uh, got into spraying a year or two ago. I think he's got a big air, air assisted airless sprayer uh, and he does some really good work he's, he's just getting into getting the doors cnc'd for his cabinets which is uh, an interesting an interesting journey uh, i think he was looking into the into the prices of getting a, a full-size cnc to do that kind of thing with a with a multi head changing uh, bit changing thing it's, it's about 20 grand apparently so yeah I'm, I'll have to check that out because that sounds uh, amazing. Yeah, check it out. Uh, uh, Alistair Johnson, Freebird Interiors on YouTube. Great uh, great channel. Well, here's a couple of chat, and this, these are just very, uh, not random, but there's a couple that just caught my eye with some of the work that they're doing oh. and, and the, the work that they're absolutely stunning attention to detail. Um, McClark Bespoke Joinery, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. based in Brentwood. Um, and they're doing uh, a, a lot of, well, some of the fitted kitchen stuff that I've seen, that uh, bespoke kitchens and, and bespoke alcove units as well, but just stunning attention to detail. Yeah. Um, I chatted with him a little bit when uh, when I was getting my sprayer, getting my Graco oh, set up, because okay, he, okay. he was using a Graco Airless initially, and he's switched over to uh, a, a higher-end HVLP now. Yeah. So, yeah, Great work. so uh, stunning work over there. Uh, link in the description. And uh, Thorson Joinery, are you Klaus Thorson? Mm, don't know that. Um, I d- I'm not sure if... I'm, oh, I'm not going to say where he's from in case I get it wrong. Sweden, Norway, I'm not <laughs> sure. But I, I'm pretty sure his business is in the UK again. Gorgeous attention to detail um, and just stunning work. It's the sort of stuff that you can only really do if you are set up for spraying. Because right. um, I just, unless I was spraying stuff in the shop and then fitted, um, you just couldn't do that. I don't think you could do that sort of stuff on site spraying. I think you would have to to get those sort of finishes on doors and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, beautiful work and. We'll pop a link in the in the show notes to both right. to all of those that we've talked about. But you know, hat, hats off. Uh, are they, they're on Instagram. I know McClark's are, are on Instagram. Is uh... yes, both on Instagram. Okay. Worth checking out if you want a bit of inspiration on on how amazing some of the work that people are are doing out there is. And uh, hopefully, they're listening to the show and and they might um, they might hear this. Yeah, fantastic. Good stuff. So, how far are we in? Well, we're one hour twenty in. Hour and twenty. Let's see if we'll try not to make this too long because I need to fly off to this this job. Um, we had a question on bandsaw table saw that was quite an interesting one. Yeah, a listener question came in from. I've printed this out and it's really really small, so I'm going to have to sort of uh, message from from James, wasn't it? Uh, uh, said uh, be shortly be setting up a small workshop, single, single garage size, and wondered whether we'd advise. 
uh, on whether to go for a bandsaw or a table saw. Uh, he says it's a tricky question. He knows, and it depends on what you're going to do. But he also has a track saw, uh, a round saw available. Um, and again, yeah, it, it, it depends so much on on what you're going to do. I, I personally find the bandsaw very useful uh, for smaller, delicate cuts, little one-offs, shaping that sort of thing. I don't use mine for for resawing. Um, and it wouldn't be much use for sizing larger sheet goods or, or timbers, uh, unless you get a particularly large one. I have been using my table saw uh, this week, actually, un- unusually for me. Most of the time, the table saw s- just sits there as a kind of an outfeed for my router table, my router bench. Uh, but it's it's perfect for the narrow rips that I've been doing for this 36 mil square thing, I've got a rip. You know, I've glued two bits of 18 mil together to get 36 mil, and then ripping them down to 24, so I can put a six mil on either side to get these sort of square section legs. Um, yeah, tricky. Uh, it, it really does depend on on, on what you want to do. I think, and of the two, I I personally probably use the bandsaw more since I've had it. Uh, then I use my table saw, but that's just me. What about you? Uh, I would definitely say the table saw. Um, I I would say I use the table saw probably 90% of the time, band saw 10% for me. Right. Um, but again, because um, just for narrow rips and, and all that sort of thing, there's, there's nothing better there. I mean, if I'm making doors, for example – and maybe I've got an 80 mil frame on the panel doors or, or whatever. Yeah. All of those, I just fly them through the table. So, and it, it's so quick for that sort of thing. I mean, obviously if you're set up with an MFT and stuff, presumably you can do that sort of stuff on the MFT. Uh, or would you? Or? You can do. Uh, I, I, I tend to get the, the 80 mil rips of doors and things just, just done by the yard. Get them. Yeah. Just get them done on a, get the, you know, eight foot lengths cut. Uh, I'll buy a guy with a panel saw. It costs more than my house. But uh, if, if but. you're fortunate enough to have a timber yard who can do the cutting for you accurately enough and they can work to a plan and stuff, then um, you can probably get away with it. But um, I, I haven't got that option. And um, the the table saw for those mm. sort of cuts is just invaluable. Um, I, I, I would say I use the table saw and track saw are about 50-50. Right. Um, and the bandsaw is pretty rare for me. Um, it's very, very handy to have, but it's more for um, resawing and kind of your your little bespoke fun projects that I tend to do on, on the bandsaw. Uh-huh. Um, but I very rarely use it for, for jobs. Um, but it's just two different ways that, that we work. Yeah, you know? yeah, sure. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, personally, I, I would wouldn't be without the table saw. I, I couldn't run my workshop without it, um, and I couldn't run the workshop without the track saw now as well. Mm. I'm, that is so embedded in the way I work, and I uh, still haven't sorted out dust extraction. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> my cyclone is still sitting on my bench, and my box of dust extraction pipe work is still sitting sealed in the box that it uh, that I bought. Seven months ago. Well, I, I did actually get around to opening one of these, one of the boxes that my CNC Have bits you? are in, but I haven't got any further with it. I took the packaging out and I, go, I went through the, the, the boxes that are inside the box uh, and I still haven't got to it. I'm going to be building this the week before Maker Central. Wow, the way, yeah. The way we'll we'll have to have a race as to who can leave a box unopened for the longest period of time. <laughs> Open for, for the longest, yeah. It's just getting the time, but <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, what else have we got? Oh, someone mentioned about um, putting a natural Danish oil finish on MDF. I, I, on, on MDF, I, yes, I saw that. I, I, I don't know if, I wasn't sure if we should mention that because it's, I, I, I'd assumed you'd put that out as, a day, as an April Fool. My, well, <laughs> that, there's a story. We'll save that for the after show. But, yeah, <laughs> yes, my MDF, uh, French polishing of MDF. April Fool video, but I'll chat about that a bit more on the after show. That was a, a comical one. Yeah, someone has it. It did actually finish really nicely, uh, but it, 
it took two days. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> uh, someone has mentioned about putting Danish oil on MDF and, and just leaving it as a natural finish. And it's like, yeah, why not? I mean, look at Val- Valkramat and all that sort of thing. That, why not? Why um, not? Valkramat with yep. just an oil Absolutely. over it looks gorgeous in, in certain situations. Uh, that can really work well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I knew a guy once who, who just, this is pre, pre-MDF or pre pre MDF being common. And he finished all his the inside of his the doors on the inside of his house in hardboard uh, and just just oiled it, lacquered it. Uh, and it looked great actually, yeah, really nice. Really? Yeah. Obviously the shiny side, not the uh, not the fuzzy side, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can go for quite a funky seventies look or something like that. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So uh, so Michael here mentioned that uh he tried the the Danish oil on on MDF. Yeah, so so tried the Danish oil on some MDF shells and applied two coats and then steel wool uh, to the shelf before applying a third coat and I found it very hard wearing, gives a good look to the shelves. So there you go. I I think in certain situations Hey, own it. Yeah. Own it. Yeah, totally. You know, it's MDF and uh, there's nothing wrong with it, and just let the honesty of the material speak for itself. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. exactly. <laughs> I quite like the idea of all this kind of in-your-face guardian. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's now going to have bare MDF. We're not going to even paint it because we're going to be that blatant about the use of it. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. Yeah. Which was kind of a little bit of what my um, the French polishing of MDF was. It yes. was a bit of a kind of finger up to the whole. Uh, MDF paranoia gang, yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll save that for the after show. Well, that French polish is pretty nasty stuff as well. I tell you, the fumes that come off that. Got to use some fairly funky uh, chemicals <laughs> to get all that together, you know. So, yeah. So I think that'll we'll keep it a, a little bit more brief today because the last few shows have have gone on a bit. So we'll wrap it up there. If we've got some Patreons to shout out to, we do indeed. Uh, I'll just say a quick thank you uh, so much to Douglas Deal. This will do. Brendan from the Shades Workshop, Tim Bowers, Nick Fajardo, Adrian Millington, Chris Davison, Paul Gardner, Eddie Carroll, James Hewitt, Carl Pountney from the Straw Bite Workshop, Steve Avery, Peter Tone, Owen Bullock, Tony Carnell, Adam Padley, Chris Mark Duthie, Max Viatz, Mark Duff, and Ben Harker. And I'd like to say a very special thank you to Harry Kappa, John T. Lynch, Duncan, Chris Stokesmore, Ben Campbell from the Colonel Collective, Jason Williams, Wilson Chan, Kevin Steer, Dominic Kozinchin, Andy Farmer, Randall Davis, David Chisnell, Kevin Miller, Piece of Timber, Andrew Marnell, James's Man Cave, Graham Bailey, Mike Broom, Rakesh Patel, Paul Cunningham, and James Ian Wilson. Uh, fantastic support from everybody. That's uh, that's really really fantastic. You are absolutely helping to keep the lights on here. Uh, we'd love your feedback, of course, uh, on the Measuring Up podcast. You can uh, email us at contact at measuringuppodcast dot com, or if you preferred modern times, then uh, we're active on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Measuring Up Podcast on Instagram and at Measuring Up PC. On Twitter, Andy, how can people reach you? You can find me at Gosforth Andy on Twitter and at Gosforth Handyman on Instagram and Gosforth Handyman on YouTube. And where do we find you, Peter? I'm Ten Minute Workshop on uh, YouTube at Ten Minute Workshop on Instagram and at Ten Minute Shop on Twitter. Music is Silver by Riot. So thank you once again for listening to the show. Fantastic to have you all around there. If you do want to help support the show, please do chip in on Patreon because this show is completely independently funded and we do absolutely rely on your support to keep this show going. And uh, you can go to patreon.com slash measuring up podcast and just chuck a dollar in the can there and it all helps kind of add up and and keep things going on the show certainly does thank you once again for listening and we shall see you next time or indeed in the after show with our Patreon supporters we'll see you there bye bye